right, Craig, you're up, buddy. You sure you can hack the system? I've hacked into the Pentagon, the Chinese currency exchange, and Obama's Skype account. I think I'll be fine. Fine. Enough talk. Get to work. Yeah. So this guy's good, huh? Yeah, he's the best. <sighs> Why? It's just, he's not even typing yet. Isn't, shouldn't he be, shouldn't you be typing? Like, super fast? Listen, don't worry. He's got this. Are you sure? All right, look, it's two, oh, it's been two minutes. Okay, hold on. ETA, buddy? How are we doing? Because those guards are going to be on our asses any second. Yeah, yeah I'll, just, I'll just tell the computer to load faster. So. But could you, though, with hacking? Ugh. Craig, those guards, they're almost... Okay, so stop the guards with bullets. Can do. I will, but there's a reasonable limit. How about you let me decide what a reasonable time limit is for hacking into a high-level security system? All I'm asking for is an ETA. A minute? What? I knew you'd be one of those people. <sighs> you think hacking is so easy. Like, like I just hit some keystrokes and the clicky thing and then boom, hack. Hello, Craig! All the time in the world. But I could be. Ow! Hacking is pretty complicated. There's a lot of guessing shit. So. Get into the security system, lock the door, and buy us some time. If only, right? Yeah. Wait, what? No, do it! Oh, okay. So I'll just, I'll hack into the head of security's gun, and then the hacked gun will shoot the guy, right? So you can't get into the security system. This isn't hackers. I'm not Swordfish. Swordfish wasn't even a character! Security systems aren't, like, a place I can find Fine. and hack into. Just please, as fast as you can. It's just... a little hard with all this stress around me. Stress? So... Fine, just imagine you have all the time in the world. Imagine you... Hack the alarm off! What did I just say about hacking? A lot of Sorry, Joe. I was wrong. Craig sucks. It's okay, Mike. At least we'll go down together. <laughs> Any questions <laughs> so far? I like these videos because they're always sort of, you know, like this is the perception that the masses get about how these things work, right? And then, then you look at reality and there's not as many hoodies and things like this and it's all very different. So, uh, yeah, no, look, that's just a bit of fun to start off with. But uh, what I really want to try and do today is, is to look at a whole bunch of new security constructs and things that all of us have available for free that are really super easy to use but a lot of us don't know are there. And I thought what I'd do is I'd sort of focus on, on the future. So what are the things that we can do, not just in the future, but now as well? And again, things that like all your users' browsers have that work for free. And we're going to talk particularly about how to do things like turn all your users' browsers into little beacons that can send you information about what's going on with your website when stuff happens. Now that's kind of like the future stuff and that's the cool stuff. And uh, you're going to see some pretty neat things, but one of the things that always still strikes me is like how low the bar is at the moment with security. And I wanted to, to try and pick an example and I thought since I'm coming to the other side of the world, I'll pick an Aussie example and we'll just be a little bit self-deprecating <laughs> for a while. So this is a Commonwealth Bank, the largest bank in Australia. They have tens of billions of dollars of revenue a year. And they are in the news recently because they had a data breach and they had to report it. We've actually finally got mandatory disclosure laws in Australia now. And what actually happened is ComBank was moving from one data centre to another one. And as it turns out, they had to like decommission one data centre and they had to destroy a whole bunch of data. Now, the way they did this is they put all of this data on a truck. True stories. Data's on a truck. And they're driving the truck to the secure destruction facility. And we've got some file footage of the truck just here. This is a truck with all the Commonwealth data. <laughs> and they've loaded it up. They've got like all the tapes, all the disks. They're going to go to one of these places, you know, with like the great big kind of shredders for hard drives and things. So they put all the data on the truck. Uh, there's about 18 million records worth of information. You can see there's a lot of data. So they're driving it along. And it, it turns out they might have put just a little bit too much data on the truck. And they lost some of it. Seriously lost some of it. KPMG had to go and audit them. And they said they retraced the route of the truck 
to determine where they could locate drives along the route, but unable to find any trace of them. They literally, like not metaphorically, but literally lost data off the back of a truck. <laughs> Biggest bank in the country. So you know what I was saying, like, just how low the bar is sometimes? Like, this isn't exactly like super sophisticated hacking, it's we had data fall off the back of a truck. Now, <laughs> when data does more metaphorically fall off the back of a truck, a lot of people go and collect it and they send it to me because I run this Have I Been Pwned service. So I get people popping up all the time saying, I have found some data and I thought you'd be interested in having a look at it for Have I Been Pwned. Now, the challenge for me is that I've got to make sure the data is legit because there's a lot of stuff out there that isn't. It's fabricated. And I also want to do the right thing. And I want to make sure that the company that has lost the data finds out about it. So I want to go through and do responsible disclosure, notification, all this sort of stuff. And this can be really, really hard. And I want to show you a recent incident of this where it was really, really hard and something that we can all do that just makes it so much easier for everyone. And it has to do with the data breach of this site. This is adult fan fiction. And you get a little bit of a sense of the demographic by the advertisement that's on there. My nine-year-old son wasn't in the audience when I rehearsed this. So, um, when one vampire really loves another vampire, <laughs> and you want to write a story about it, and this is what it is. It, it's like erotica, but for like elves and warlocks and things like this. Yeah, that's OK. Whatever. <laughs> Fair enough. So I verified it. It was legitimate. So the data was actually breached from this site. And one of the ways I verify this, and really simple ways, if you come across a bunch of data and you're like, is it from this site? I'll look at the alleged data, and I'll go and grab, say, three random Mailinator addresses. So lots of people sign up at Mailinator.com because they don't want to leave their real email address. Now, Mailinator addresses are public mailboxes. You can go to Mailinator.com, put in whatever the alias is, and see the contents of the box. So if I grab three of those addresses and I go to like the password reset feature and I drop them in and then each one of those addresses gets a mail, chances are it's legit. So I verified this one this way and then I sent them an email. Hi, I'm Troy Hunt. You may remember me from such data breach. No, I don't do that. But <laughs> I give them a message with enough information to verify the authenticity. So you'll see here I've given them password hashes next to email address, or next to, in this case, usernames. So, you know, you can go to your database, assuming this is them and they get this, you go to the database and go, oh, you know, this one, daffodil33 or whatever, here's the MD5 hash, oh, look, it matches, maybe he's legit. So I did that, you see I sent it to two different email addresses, two different published email addresses on the website, I'm not guessing these. Sent it to them on the 19th of July, this was last year, and Crickets, like just nothing. And this is what often happens. You just get nothing back when people try to let organisations know. So I went ahead and loaded the data. Now, this is 6th of August, so we're nearly three weeks along. <sighs> Load in, have I been pwned, dates of birth, email address. I don't know why you need date the birth to read like vampire porn. I don't get the point. But anyway, password stored in both MD5 and plain text which makes upgrading your hashing algorithm really easy. It's like, oh, <laughs> here's the plain text version. <laughs> and as you can see, like 79% of these accounts had already been breached before. They were already in Have I Been Pwned from previous incidents. So data's gone out there, and inevitably people start jumping onto their forum talking about it. Now, to me, like the, the first thing that should strike anyone reading this on the forum is, hey, someone who uses our forum has just received an email saying that their email address has been exposed in a data breach of people who use the forum. You know, like you're trying to join the dots together, go, well, this is probably going to be a data breach. So someone else pops in as well. Said, I got this notice too. <coughs> All right, so multiple verification. Sounds legit. Now, then it sort of got really interesting. So Demon Goddess chimed in, and Demon Goddess is a head evil tech wench. Uh, this is my life these days. <laughs> the things I see. Uh, so anyway, she's there and she says, look, it's not true. One would think that instead of scaring users, these companies would contact the site itself. So, <laughs> okay, but by how? Email? So um, she didn't quite feel it was legit and she uh, sent me an email. Said none of it exists in my database. 
I've been working hellacious hours at my day job, Demon Goddess 061. I kind of have these mental images, like, what does Demon Goddess 061 do? Maybe she's like a formal lawyer or something like that, and she gets in a suit every day and is a very normal person. I don't know. Anyway, uh, she actually sent me two emails. Sent me that one, sent me another one. Said, now I've verified it doesn't exist in my database. Didn't exactly clarify how she'd verified it, but apparently it doesn't exist. I expect you to remove this from your site now, please. I guess it's polite. Uh, I, I didn't. <laughs> so I, I replied and explained the situation. But what, what I found very interesting then was, was someone else came along and chimed in. Uh, this is Bronx Wench. Uh, she's a mighty dragon wench. And she said, <laughs> this is all true. She said, uh, there's no gain in hacking us. We're not an e-commerce site. Now, I actually think this is really interesting. There's loads and loads of organisations out there, or loads of websites. I don't even know if we can call these guys an organisation. It's probably just a volunteer thing. Loads of them that say that there's no perceived value in hacking us because they can't imagine why someone would want to do it. There's a very easy answer why someone would want to do it. Because you're on the internet. That's the answer. You're there. If you're looking to terrify people into buying security software, that's an extremely effective gambit. I, um, I don't actually have any security software to sell, so I'm not quite sure how that happened. She went on. Sell private workshops and courses. <laughs> Guilty. During these, you'll be offered the opportunity to purchase security packages. Anyone who came to my workshop the last couple of days, how many things did you buy from me? <laughs> Nothing. I gave you stickers. Come on. Like, that's what happened. <laughs> If anyone wants have I been pwned stickers, I'll chuck a stash of them up here later. So, you know, it's, it's not that. And, and I guess what I'm finding interesting here is that there is often a, I guess almost a healthy degree of suspicion, but misplaced. And eventually she said, uh, we don't have high-priced lawyers who will take them. Why are you taking me to court? You lost the data. <laughs> you know, how's this working out? Won't report him for publishing the data without permission. That's what I intend to do. It was in August. So far, no lawyers, <laughs> which is nice. But you, you sort of see like, how difficult... Like, all I wanted to do with this site here is try and disclose it privately so that they could deal with it in the right way and they could let people know and they could try and avoid this turning into an absolute shitstorm of problems, which it ultimately did, and the thread went on for ages. And the only reason I was able to get that is from archives.org because they went and deleted the whole thing because it's not a good look for them, obviously. Eventually, the penny dropped. Now, another example of this is, uh, this is Lewis. This is Dublin's rail system. Well, this was Lewis. This is what the website used to look like. Then earlier this year, it looked like this. This is the whole, like, not a lot of design aesthetic, <laughs> but this was the whole website. You are hacked. I write that you have serious security holes you didn't reply. Next time someone talks to you, press the reply button. Now, I don't know how this person tried to contact them. I don't know what the tone of the email was like. But inevitably, they were a little bit surprised once this happened to their website. You know, you would be. Now, this, this bloke, I think if we, if we look at their motives, probably wasn't real good. <laughs> Give me a Bitcoin or I'll publish all your data. <laughs> As best I can tell, it's never happened. I certainly haven't had it sent to me for Have I Been Pwned. But again, it sort of demonstrates the problem. Like, how do you get in touch with organisations and let them know? Like, what is the channel? This was their update after it happened. Lewis website was compromised. They finished by saying, this may take the day to resolve. Jan 3. Here's Jan 10. This is the website, Jan 10. Jan 17. And if you look at it today, it looks like the previous image. So they're still down today. And what are we at now? Like four weeks on. So obviously, this sort of absolutely blindsided them. Now, let's, let's sort of move on, though, and talk about solutions, because there's a really dead easy, simple solution to this, and it's this. Has anyone used a security.txt file in their website? One person, and Scott Helm, who already knew this. Proposed standard which allows websites to define security policies. Now, here's what's super, super awesome about this. All you do is you put a text file there. This is a text file. Like, of all the different things that you could do security-wise or spend money on, like, this has got to be the simplest thing ever. You create a text file, 
and you put it on your site in the well-known directory. And I can show you what it looks like on Have I Been Pwned. It looks just like that. And what's awesome about this is that if someone does actually find a security vulnerability, or God forbid they find a data breach on Have I Been Pwned, I'm not immune from this, then at least they're going to know how to find me and also how to communicate securely as well. It's just a text file. So that's super cool. This has been uh, built by a guy called Ed Overflower. He's to certainly prepared the proposed spec. Clever security researcher who's come up with a really simple idea that just works well. Now, what's happening is we're seeing it in all sorts of different websites now. Implement this. So here's Google's. Here's where you contact, encryption, acknowledgements, policy. Would you like a job? There's a hiring section. Because the sorts of people who find these vulnerabilities, you know, maybe they're looking for work and they've gone and tried to do the responsible thing. Dropbox has got one. Similar sort of deal. You see they've got comments as well. So in this case, Dropbox uses HackerOne. So they've got a bug bounty program via HackerOne. BBC's got a big one with a lot of comments. And they're all the same sort of thing, right? It's just a plain text file that adheres to a spec. There's actually a load of different websites out there now using security.txt files. And you can see them all via Scott Helm's crawler.ninja service. So Scott has this little crawler that goes around, indexes the top one million websites every single day, and he puts a whole bunch of stats on crawler.ninja. Stats about things like who's still serving pages over HTTP and not HTTPS? Who's using modern security constructs? And this list here of who's actually using a security.txt file, and it's, it's really fulfilling to sort of see the numbers tick up for something so simple and organisations acknowledging that Sometimes stuff goes wrong. So that's dead simple. Use a security.txt file. I'd love to see your organizations appearing on Scott's list and helping sort of bump that number up. So another thing that's been happening a lot lately is we've seen these guys featured a lot. Does anyone know who Magecart is? All right, so this is going to be interesting. Now, Magecart is sort of like a collective of what appears to be different groups who've been very good at ripping off credit cards from websites. And they've been in the news a heap, particularly in the last year. So I've seen headlines like this. British Airways, 380,000 sets of payment details. And what's always been really impactful about these stories is it's not just like primary account number. It's the CVV as well. So you know the thing that you're never meant to have after processing. And people have been seeing these headlines and going, holy shit, like British Airways is storing CVVs in plain text and people are ripping it off. And it's not just British Airways. Ticketmaster had a really big one. So Ticketmaster, same situation. Complete credit card data. Not just that, but any other information entered into the page as well. Just a couple of weeks ago, OXO. So OXO creates a whole bunch of sort of appliances and things for the kitchen. And what I want to do is, is sort of show you what's actually happening in these cases and then show you a really good defence against this. So with the OXO one, what actually happened, in fact, what happened with all of these is it was just a very simple case of one line of code being injected into the site. So here's what the code looks like. It's just a script tag. In all of these cases, MageCut, whoever they are, managed to get this one script file embedded. This was the one in OXO. They're called different things in different other places. They're, they're not always sort of the same indicators of compromise. But it's always a script tag pulled from somewhere else. Now, how do they get it on these sites? Well, a lot of sites have things like content management systems. Some of those content management systems have vulnerabilities. A lot of those content management systems are accessed by people with terrible passwords that have appeared in data breaches that spread all around. And then the passwords are reused, and people go and test them. Now I'm into the CMS. So they get this script file on here. This is what the file on OXO looked like. Now, we're not going to read all of this, but if you have a look at like the first half of it, we see these arrays of field names. And what this script is actually doing is it's listening to changes on the field names. So if there's a change in this field, get the value of the field and send it off to somewhere else. And I wanted to mock this up just to sort of show you how it works and then show you how the defense works. So what I did is I created a version of OXO locally. Now, this is running on OXO.com. I've got a host entry to set maps directly to my local IIS. 
Now this looks like a normal page. Normal checkout page, normal card data, all the sorts of stuff you'd expect to get when you're paying for something. But if I pop open the DevTools and I jump over here to the Network tab, and what we'll do is just start filling in fields. So let's fill in this card number. That'll do. And then as soon as I tab off, there's a request. Expiry, expiry year, CVV. And then each one of these changes is sending off a request, in this case, to evilcyberhacker.com. Uh, incidentally, normally it's not like sending data to magecarter'shackedyou.com, right? It's some, it's some like really, really benign looking name, and you would have seen the one with the JS file before. It didn't look suspicious. But what it's doing is it's making, making a request over this URL. We've got a token here which is consistent across each one of those requests so that we can tie them all together. We've got the host where the request has come from, which is up here. So you can imagine this being embedded on multiple different sites. Now you've got the host, you know where it's come from. And then we've got the field name, and then we've got the value in the field. And that's it. And like you see how simple this is. This is like literally a JavaScript keylogger. If you can get that one line of script on a target site, you can do stuff like this. Now the thing is, there's also a really super, super, super easy defense for this. I mean, other than just like not leaving your CMS completely open. Uh, but also, it's not always your own CMS too, and you'll see why in a moment. So one of the things we can do is we can use a content security policy. Now I'm kind of curious, has anyone here built a CSP before? Now if I take away all the people in my workshop, <laughs> over the last couple of days, there's going to be like four or five people. Because content security policies are really, really rarely used. So Scott's stats from his crawler show it's like 3.5% of the top million websites. So I'm going to show you what the content security policy does and how it stops this sort of thing. So I've got another tab here. It's exactly the same site. The only difference is, is that there's now a CSP. I'm going to show you how the CSP works. If I reload this page, and I'm going to look at the first request here. And I'm going to look at the response headers. I've got one down here that says content-security-policy. And this is a really, really simple CSP that says, hey, you can load anything from self, default source self. You can load images and style sheets and media and whatever else. You can also load scripts from self. You can have unsafe inline scripts, which is like blocks of scripts. And then we've got some definitions here around styles and fonts. This is a really, really super simple CSP, but the main reason I wanted to show this is that it fundamentally changes the execution of this page. And we know that because if we go over to the console tab, we've got this. This is the JavaScript file that had been embedded in the page. Again, it wouldn't normally be called evilcyberhacker.com or magecart.js, but it's an unexpected JavaScript file loaded from an untrusted location. So because my content security policy doesn't say that you can load scripts from evilcyberhacker.com, if a script is loaded, it gets blocked. So this is the browser blocking it. So the browser sees the CSP, sees this request, and goes, no, this wasn't on the list. Now, even if you manage to compromise a CMS and get a script tag on the page, you're not going to be able to modify headers. You're not going to be able to stop this defense from happening. So now the attacker has to go, well, I've got to find another way. Like, I've got to actually find a way of getting my script onto one of the whitelisted script sources, which shouldn't be able to happen if you choose wisely. You know, you don't whitelist like all the GitHub, <laughs> for example. So this is good. Like, this will stop the problem. But there's something else we can do, because this doesn't really let us know that there's a problem. When I say us, I mean like us as the site administrators. So we're going to take this a little bit further. We'll go over to another tab here. And I'm going to show you what my policy looks like this time. I've got the same console error here, but I'm just going to reload the page on the network tab because my policy has changed very, very slightly. So here's my policy, but now I've got this report URI directive. And what this does is it says, if this content security policy fires, if it blocks something, let me know. And by letting me know, it's going to send a JSON payload to the report URI that you see there. Now, there's a service that Scott and I run, report-uri.com, where we enable organizations to send their CSP reports there. We process about half a billion reports a day. You can stand up your own CSP endpoint as well. <laughs> Try not to DDoS yourself. It's very easy. So you can stand up your own one. But I want to show you what's actually in here. 
So if I go back to network tab just here, I'm going to close that one. I'm going to go down all the way. You'll see there was actually an error here. One of these didn't load. Magecart.js blocked by CSP. So this is the browser doing its thing with the CSP. And this request just here is to the report URI I defined. Now if I give us a little bit more room here, you'll see that this is a, where are we? I'm going to scroll down a little bit. It's a post request and it has a JSON body. And here's what's in that JSON body. So it gives me the blocked URI. So what was attempted to be loaded from another location? So imagine you're like responsible for a website and you're getting this report. You can go, oh, that's a bit weird. You know, like I can't remember embedding magecart.js from evilcyberhacker.com. I wonder where it happened. Well, I've got the document URI. The document URI tells me the URI that triggered this particular CSP violation. And this is what I meant earlier on when I said like turning all your users into little beacons because anyone around the world using your website and getting hit with this script is going to be sending you a report letting you know. So this is really super powerful. You can take this and you can go and figure out how on earth they're getting script on your site which isn't meant to be there. So try and use a CSP. The CSPs are super awesome. You can always create a CSP and not block. You can create a CSP that only reports. Like if you're worried about breaking stuff, you create the same policy, except it's just content-security-policy-report-only. And then it won't break stuff. And just to give you an idea of, of how innocent you can be in the whole thing, the Ticketmaster incident wasn't a vulnerability in their service. It's a vulnerability in this service. This is Inventor, and Inventor does chatbots. Now, because Ticketmaster decided to put a chatbot on their page, which a lot of companies do these days, and because Inventor then got compromised, you get like this cascading supply chain of vulnerabilities. You know, you're dependent on Inventor. Inventor then gets injected with a script that comes from somewhere else. It cascades all the way up and runs in the browser. So you can be perfectly innocent in the whole thing, but if a third party that you're using has a compromise, then it's game over. So that was the CSP side of things. One of, the, uh, one of the other areas that I think is getting really interesting at the moment, and I want to sort of talk about where things typically go wrong with a good example, is around IoT. Now, as far as internet connected things go, a car is pretty significant. There's a Nissan Leaf. And a, a few years ago, I was running a workshop in Norway. And we, we do this exercise on the first day where what you do is you take your mobile device like this and you route it through your PC and then you run Fiddler on the PC. Who's run Fiddler before? A room full of developers, almost everyone. So you run Fiddler. So Fiddler you can configure to allow remote computers, which includes devices. You can configure to allow remote computers to connect and they proxy through there. So it's just a couple of steps. You're now sending everything from your device through your Fiddler. So uh, the bloke was in my class, he, he said, look, it's, it's interesting, my car has a companion app that looks like this. And I, I was kind of curious, I was like, why? <laughs> like, do you really want to connect your car? What's the value proposition of this? And he said, well, the reason we do this in Norway is it's so cold, we've got to be able to turn the heater on in the car before we get in. Now, some of you are nodding. I think this happens in the UK sometimes as well, right? So it's very different in Australia. Australia gets so hot, if you get in your car too quickly and you sit on the seatbelt, this happens. <laughs> and this is real. I was in the news a couple of weeks ago. It was like 45 degrees or something. Guy gets in his car. Not so good. Anyway, this is not about like branded tattoos or seatbelts. So different set of problems in Norway. Now, he was curious, right? Like how does my phone know how to talk to my car. Because there's a lot of Nissan Leafs out there, a lot of mobile apps. And, and what he was really asking is, he's like, what is the API key? Is there some sort of a bearer token, for example? And he, he's trying to sort of decompose the request, figure out what the API key is, and he discovers that the API key, so the secret that you need to connect to the car, is printed in the windscreen of every car because the API key was the VIN number. So I was walking around Norway just like taking photos of Nissan Leafs. That's my Leaf, that's my Leaf. <laughs> because now you own anything that you could do with the mobile app. So the mobile app could turn on the heating, also turn on the air conditioning, pull back the trip history, pull back the battery status. 
And you're going to see what these requests look like in a moment. I obfuscated the last few digits because you could do some pretty nasty stuff, but also the last few digits are innumerable. So you could take one VIN number and then just keep guessing other VIN numbers and all these other cars would start to pop up. And we had to verify this because we're like, this, this is actually a genuinely serious problem. We're going to need to do something about this. So we verified it. We waited until we could identify one other car, pull back something benign. We didn't start changing climate control or anything. You know, pull back the battery status, for example. And then I got in touch with Nissan. And uh, I remember I, was, I sent a tweet. It's like, hey, does anyone have a security contact at Nissan? That, that's, it's a bit like shining the bat light because immediately everyone's like, oh, crap. <laughs> Nissan's had a problem. <laughs> And I got someone from Nissan uh, pretty quickly, to their credit, and we, uh, we had a, an email exchange, had a phone call, a lot of backwards and forwards, and they took it very seriously for about a week. <laughs> and then they got busy, you know, they, they had other stuff to do. And I couldn't get a reply from them. I, like, I couldn't drive them to the point where they were actually going to fix the problem. Like, they just, I think they just put it in the too hard basket, and I was being annoying. And it's, you know, that, that's a hard thing, because what, what do you do? Like, you know that there's a serious vulnerability. Like, this is not just a major privacy issue, pulling back data on someone else's car, but I don't want randos changing things in my car from the other side of the world. Like, that just feels, maybe it's just me. It feels weird. So, I was kind of trying to figure out what to do, and about a month after I first discovered it, I was having a bit of a Google around, and I found that other people had discovered it too. And what actually happened is other people had said the Nissan app is so crap that we have got a better way of turning on the heater whilst you're laying in bed all snugly. What you do is you go to this URL with the VIN number and you just change the VIN number to your own. And then you put that as a favourite in your browser. Make car hot, make car cold. And these people were very proud of themselves because they're like, we have solved the problem. Now it's easy. I think some people are probably upset because they're going, wait, hang on a moment. You were changing state with a get request. This is no good. <laughs> but, but yeah, this is what it did. Like, just a get request, VIN number in the URL. And I'm looking at it going, do you not realize what you have found? Like, you could change it for anyone. So I got to the point where I was like, OK, well, we've got to, we've got to publish this. We've got to make this public because that's the only way change is going to happen. Like, you do get to this point where it's like they're just not paying attention, you're going to go public. And I discovered that Scott Helm had a Nissan Leaf, which made things much easier. So now I've got someone who's in the same field, knows what they're doing, let's do a blog post together. And I wanted to do something which was, like, impactful enough to drive change, but didn't overly sensationalise it. So what we decided to do is a video. And I went back to Australia and I sat by my pool. Scott's in England, which is why he looks kind of sad. <laughs> and, and I did this video. I'm going to show you like a very, very short clip of it here. Uh, so look, what we want to do then is uh, see what I can control from this end. And I, I guess the, the first thing is I can see that you're, you've got a big jacket on. It's cold there. Should we look at uh, what we might be able to do with the heater, see if we can bring you up to Australia temps for a little bit? So um, here's what we did next. I hit this URL. Now, he has since sold the car. <laughs> this was his VIN number. Doesn't have it anymore. So here's the URL. It's just a GET request. You can see the VIN number in there. Uh, and of course, if you modify that VIN number to another one, it's game over. The last five digits of that VIN were the ones that were enumerable. And then it would respond. And here's the JSON response that came back. And you see it also has his user ID. So there's a little bit of personal information leakage just in the request. So you know, if, if you sort of put the, the hat on of what could I do with this? Well, if I could just keep enumerating numbers, not only could I find cars, but then I could find the user IDs who own them. And this one does kind of identify him, right? So I hit this, and here's what happened next. Heat then. Oh, there we go. Oh, my heat and seats have come on. <clears throat> yeah, the air conditioning and the fans have just come on as well. Uh, and you can see up in the, there's a status indicator on the dashboard to shut go up the, 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 the the car's currently being controlled remotely, uh, which is now blinking. And I'm not sure if you can hear that, but um, all of the fans have come on on full power. It's actually quite loud in here. And that was it. Like, now his heater's on. And that was pretty impactful. And then we got all these big news headlines. It's like car hacking. And it's like, I always lament that a little bit, because it's like, no, someone else can't drive your car. But yeah, it was kind of car. Look, if it drives change and it makes the right stuff happen, that's good. 
And, uh, and you wouldn't believe it, suddenly it was important to Nissan. <laughs> like, it wasn't important when it was just me. It's different when it's like Wired magazine and New York Times, like stuff tends to happen then. But one of the sort of points I wanted to make here, I think there's a really interesting lesson for people building APIs about how this sort of stuff happens, because we see it time and time again. So, I mean, let's imagine sort of the workflow of this. We imagine we've got our, our Nissan Leaf user here, very happy little Nissan Leaf user, <laughs> saving the world. It's an electric vehicle. And they use the app. And they're communicating with the mobile app. Their entire experience with the APIs and everything else is via an app. The tester's entire experience is via the app. But the app is then communicating in the back end to the API. You don't see the API. You don't see a URL in the address bar or anything like this. It's hidden behind the veneer of a rich client app. Now, just to be clear as well, it's not like the Nissan Leaf was running Apache, right? It doesn't actually run the web server. It then back channels to the car. So it goes out of a GSM or something like that. So we get very, very focused on this part of the communication. We get very, very focused on how do people interact with our app. And we very often overlook this part. And what I find is there's a lot of assumption that's made. So developers assume that people will always use the app, and then the app can only communicate to the API this way, because, hey, I built the app and the API. They always work together. No one's going to go directly to the API and change it. But it's an assumption. And we know what they say about assumptions. Assumption is the mother of all fuckers. <laughs> and that keeps leading us back to the same position again and again and again. So assume that people are going to use your APIs in ways that you never expected, because they will. They'll discover what the APIs are behind your rich client apps, and they'll make them do things that you never expected. Now, there was a follow-up to the Nissan Leaf story. And it all started when they actually had it offline for like six weeks. It was ages. They took a long time to fix it. They got it back online, and then, then Scott sent me a screen cap, and he said, have a look at the app. Do you see anything unusual about the app? And I'm looking at this image, going, well, it's a normal app. And then I'm reading the app. <laughs> and this is literally what Nissan put in their app to control cars. And we were curious, where did this come from? We found it. There's this Stack Overflow question. And if we scroll down, there's an answer. It says this. So someone had gone to Stack Overflow and literally copied and pasted this to control a car. <laughs> and they never understood what it did. And you know what's even worse? What's the second highlighted word? Spirit, right? What's the second word? <laughs> so, so they, they hadn't even copied and pasted it. Like they had literally, <laughs> like they're reading it and retyping it. No idea what it does. And one of the reasons why I show this is to sort of demonstrate that even really large, well-resourced organizations can still just make the most egregious cock-ups with stuff like this. And just because you're going and buying like a car doesn't mean it's going to be any better than any of the other IoT connected crap you can get these days. There was one other thing actually that happened. Uh, because it was off so long, offline so long, a whole bunch of people got upset because now they had to get out of bed and turn their car on. And uh, one bloke from the UK left this feedback on the Google Play Store. And he wasn't very happy. And in his very polite British way, took a shot at me. <laughs> and I was actually kind of chuffed. I was like, OK, well, this, this is good. Like, this is a reminder that people out there literally need saving from themselves. So I, I printed it out and framed it and put it on my desk. <laughs> 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 and you know, again, like, the thing that just continues to strike me is like, how massive an organization this was and how bad this was and the copying. Of the, like, just, it was one of those multifaceted vulnerabilities. So speaking of vulnerabilities, one of the things that we, we still have happening a lot is cross-site scripting. Like cross-site scripting is still a big thing. We're getting a bit better at it, not necessarily because we as builders are getting better, but because frameworks are getting better. Go and use ASP.NET MVC, everything gets output encoded. Doesn't always save you, but it does move us in the right direction. 
But we still got a lot of XSS. And I've got this little video here that I saw a Dutch journalist do a couple of years ago, a guy called Breno de Venter. And he went and tested a whole bunch of Dutch banks because he wanted to try and find XSS vulnerabilities in banks. Now, I'm going to play this. It only is very short. But everything that you see and hear in the video is done with JavaScript. And it's injected via cross-site scripting. Which is good fun, right? Now, incidentally, when hackers find vulnerabilities like cross-site scripting with banks, they normally don't do that, right? Like, they do, think about it this way, they do anything that you can do with JavaScript. So, like, in your minds, go, well, what can you do with JavaScript? Yeah, basically anything, right? So you can do almost anything with JavaScript. In fact, if you look at the URL right towards the end of it, you can see he's got an eval statement in there. So eval is obviously like concatenating up a string somewhere, possibly to bypass XSS filters, and then he's just evaling the string and it executes. So obviously we've got a lot of XSS out there. We've got some really, really cool defenses that are either natively built into the browser, but a lot of people don't know they're there or how they work, or they turn them off. We'll talk about it in a moment. And there's some other really neat stuff we can do too. So I'm going to show you how this works. I created a little app called Search for Beer. It does one thing. Beer. That's it. It says, you search for beer. Now, you'll see up in the address bar, we've got beer. It's up here. It's passed in a query string. It's then reflected down here. So this is reflected insofar as we provide information with the request. It could be in the query string. could be in a header. could be in a body. And then it's reflected back in the response. Now, if I was to go and make this a bit more interesting and actually put some script in here. So we'll do script alert. I like there, like that, bam, bam, bam. And we'll close off that script tag like so. Yeah, yeah, I know, I just can't type. <laughs> I need beer. <laughs> All right, I'm going to put that on the clipboard because I'm going to use it a few times. Let's go search, bam. OK, so this is like super, super simple stuff. And you can picture in your minds what's probably happened. But just for the sake of transparency, down in the source code, here we go. Now that. The, the interesting thing here is, you think about it from the browser's perspective, the browser's just like, hey, I got an HTML response that had a script tag in. I'm just going to execute what's in the script. So in, in a way, this is kind of doing like exactly what you would expect it to do. But in another way, your, your browser actually has defenses to stop this from happening in the first place. And in fact, the only way I could do this in Chrome is I had to turn the defense off. So if I go back to the network tools and I reload this page, like so, and I go to the first request here, and I go to the response. You still like beer, very good. Uh, in the response headers, I have a header which is X XSS protection. And I'll set that to zero. Your browser has a native XSS auditor. And what the auditor does is it looks for script that appears on the page but has come with the request. Because that smells like XSS, right? And the browser goes, no, nah, we're not going to let any of that happen. We're going to stop that script from running. And in fact, if we look at the source code of the page, what you'll see is it's gone and highlighted that script and said, hey, this has been flagged. So if we go down to here, actually, no, we're going to steal it on the next one, sorry. See it on the next one. So at the moment, what we've done is we've just turned it off. The next one, which is where I was just going with this, let's try it here, bam, bam, no script. That's what I was just looking for down here. Token contains a reflected XSS vector. So it's identified that this has come in the script and it's disabled it. Now, what we're seeing here is the difference between turning the auditor off together and, in this case, the auditor running in what's referred to as mode 1. So if I reload this page so I can see the response header, I go back to the first request, which is there, I go down to here, mode 1. So mode 1 will actually stop it from running. Now, this looks good, but you've got to sort of think it through a little bit further as well. If someone is able to make a request to the page with a piece of script that then also appears somewhere in the response, the script doesn't run. So what if 
someone disabled a piece of script deliberately. It's not that they wanted XSS, they actually wanted to disable a piece of script. Maybe there's some script in there to block nasty stuff. An attacker says, I'm going to stop the script from running. And the only well, the way I can do that very, very easily is I can just include that script somewhere in a query string parameter. So this is a bit of a problem because now what we've done is we've just killed a part of the site which was meant to work. Which brings us to the next one here. Now before I do the search, let's have a look at the header. So we'll go here, we'll load that header. Now we have mode block. So XSS protection is on, the mode is set to block. This is actually the browser default. If you don't change XSS headers at all, your browser will do this by default. Now, around about here, you might be wondering, why would you turn it off? Well, because it broke something on a legacy app, and hey, it was an easy fix. Because sometimes people do pass around clumps of JavaScript in query strings, because that's the way the app was designed. Like there are, it is hard to fathom how many problems there are, <laughs> like if you start doing that that people turn it off because of that reason. So let's have a look at what happens now, because now we're on on and block. And we'll go there, we'll go here, we'll drop that script in, we'll search. Let's see what's going to happen this time. Well, it's actually a local connection. OK, so, oh, there we go. Hmm. Maybe it's just more like my local IIS going slow. Error, block by XSS auditor. So by default, what will happen if the XSS auditor fires? It'll kill the whole page. It's like we're just not going to load it at all. Something very suspicious has happened. We need to kill everything. So this is really cool. This stops that problem before, which is that an attacker can come and start disabling pieces of script. So that moves us in the right direction. But per the CSP discussion earlier on as well, I would actually like to know, right? Like if I've got XSS on my site, and even though the auditor is blocking it, I still want to know that I've got a cross-site scripting on my site. So there's one more thing we can do as well. What I'm going to do, I'm actually going to connect back to this Wi-Fi because I think this is also, wow, is the NDC London connection dead? Let's try and connect again. So I'm, <laughs> because of experience, I'm not actually going to be dependent on external things. I might just try speakers here. Oh, now it's on there. We'll disconnect that one. We'll go back to here. But it is possibly loading external assets as well, which is why it's going a little bit slower. So anyway, while that's connecting, maybe, we'll go here and we'll try one more thing. Here's what it is. DevTools, Network tab, open. We're going to reload this page, back up to here, down to here, one, mode block. But then I've got this report attribute. And I've got an endpoint here where if there is a violation, it's going to send a report to. And this is a little bit like the CSP reporting before. And it goes back to the earlier point of you can turn all of your visitors' browsers into little beacons that let you know when something goes wrong. So in order to demonstrate this one, I need to open up Fiddler and actually catch that request on the wire. We're not going to be able to see it in Chrome's DevTools. So we're going to go to here, try the attack again, bam, like that, search for beer. That's going to make the request. In Fiddler here, we've now got a request to this path, which is the one that was my, my report value, into the inspectors, and then if I go and have a look at the JSON request, this is what you get. And you can see that the request URL has the full URL that was requested, including the payload. And if you ever get one of these reports, you know that someone has managed to get that script tag running on a browser somewhere. Which is cool. So again, we're like just orchestrating everyone's browsers, and there are all these little beacons reporting stuff back to you. What I love about this, and the CSP stuff and the security TXT stuff as well, is that all of this is like totally for free. You get this without paying any money whatsoever. You just have to turn the things on. There's a lot of security out there that would like to charge you a lot of money, very often for things that don't actually do what they're meant to do. Which brings me to this. So I have done a lot of talks before around extended validation certificates and basically how pointless they are. And I want to sort of make a point here because this is, a few things have changed since I did the talk in London last year and delved into it. Uh, one thing that's changed is Komodo is no longer Komodo. Well, actually, they were no longer Komodo, they were Komodo CA, and now they're no longer Komodo CA, now they're Sectiga. They still sell extended validation SSL certificates. 
So you know how most websites you go to over HTTPS is a padlock? And that's it, just a padlock. It's domain validation. You've proven that you can control the domain. If you go to, say, your bank, you might see extended validation. The bank's name up there in the address bar, they've had to prove that they are the bank in order to get that displaying. And commercial certificate authorities have been pimping these really hard because you basically can't sell domain validation certificates anymore because Let's Encrypt has come along and done it for free. And frankly, done it better because they've made it automated as well. So CA, sell EV on the premise of things like the green address bar, prominently displaying your company name. Incidentally, what colour is it in Chrome today? Grey. Grey, exactly. It's not green anymore. You've got to change all the marketing. Here's a fun fact, or here's a fun trivia fact. Who knows what colour it is in Safari on iOS? It's green. But then DV is grey. So you've got to remember which browser displays it which way. And it's changing. It used to be green in Chrome. I can barely keep up. How's everyone else going to keep up? So lets you know that your site is secure. And they go and say, this immediately gives them the confidence to complete their transaction. And, and this is the sales pitch, right? Like, if you show the green bar, which isn't green, we've established this now, if you show the green bar, then people will go through and they'll actually check out and they will pay for the item in their shopping cart. And again, like, we normally see this used by the likes of financial institutions. And we see it used by entities like PayPal. I just realised I'm going to need an internet connection, so this is going to be interesting. Uh, let's try this. Who thinks that PayPal has an extended validation certificate? Jesus, oh, not many. <laughs> a couple. Who thinks it doesn't? Doesn't really add up, but I get the sentiment. All right, so a bunch of people think it does. Now, the, the fun thing here is that if we go to paypal.com and there is not an extended validation certificate, will you leave and not use the site? Because this is all it is, right? It is a visual control. And it's entirely predicated on users changing their behaviour in the absence of that indicator. We seem to have internet. Let's see how it goes. Slow internet builds suspense. It's coming. Come on. OK, so as you can see, no EV indicator. <laughs> I think the connection dropped again. Oh, no, there we go. OK, now as you can see, no EV. It's just really, really super slow. No EV indicator. Isn't that interesting? What happens if you're using Firefox? Let's try that. That might make it interesting. Oh, crap. <laughs> Uh, uh, it might be Fiddler killing. Good point. Let's get rid of Fiddler. Once you route everything through there, fun things do tend to happen. Let's see how we go here. Oh, look at that. Can I, just so that everyone sees this. Wait, check, check Chrome again. I can do it. <laughs> ah, because you think it's Fiddler. He's like, damn, Troy coming on doing these tricks to try and trick us into thinking there's no EV on PayPal. I'll show him. Oh, look, it's still DV. <laughs> well, it looks like DV, doesn't it? This is the same certificate that served up to both. Now, here's a fun story with this. I was doing a talk at NDC in Sydney in September. And as part of that talk, I show a website using EV and a website using DV. And the one that I always used to demonstrate EV was PayPal. And then I'm up on the stage, and I'm like an autopilot. And here's PayPal. As you can see, it's got EV. Oh, shit, what's happened? It's gone. <laughs> And I was literally, while I was on the stage, I've gone, this is amazing, there's no more EV. And I got off, and Scott was there as well, and we sat down, and we're pulling this thing apart, we're trying to figure out what's happened, and we're like, oh, this is going to be amazing. Like, they're going to fix it really, really soon, because otherwise people abandon their shopping carts and they won't buy anything, because Komodo told us. <laughs> that was September. And we're still here. And, and what's ultimately happened is the way that they have implemented that certificate in the Windows certificate store, it's no longer showing the visual indicator for EV. But Firefox has got its own certificate store. It shows things differently. So in Firefox, you get the indicator. In anything on Windows, including Edge, you don't get the indicator. And what I find fascinating is like four months later, they haven't changed it. Now, I propose 
that PayPal has the money to go out and buy another EV certificate, if it's important. Doesn't seem to be important. I would love, I'd really, really like to find someone at PayPal and go, hey, by any chance, have you like AB tested this? Like, are you having people abandoning check? Well, they, they wouldn't, because otherwise they'd get a bloody certificate. So, you know, obviously it's not doing anything for like one of the world's largest online payment processes. However, let's not let that stop people promoting buying EV certificates. And I want to give you a couple of fun examples here. So there's this little video here that Komodo, now Komodo CA, now Sectigo, has been promoting in order to go and buy certificates. I'm going to show you what this video looks like, and it demonstrates the importance of a website having an EV certificate. Visitors to a site with an EVSSL certificate see their browser address bar turn green whenever they are on a secure or HTTPS page, typically among the most critical during a session. Right at the moment of truth, when they're weighing whether or not to go forward with a transaction, the striking visual indicator, accompanied by information certifying their business name, location, and the certification authority that validated it is presented, providing needed reassurance to continue. Right at the moment of truth. That's, that sounds much dirtier when I say it like that. And the green address bar, which we've had the discussion. It's not green except for the times that it is. Um, you see the website? There was this website called Excalibur Cutlery. Excalibur Cutlery's got EV, so now more people will trust their website. Except the problem is, is that when you look at Excalibur Cutlery, <laughs> but, and you know, actually, you know, it's really interesting. Let's actually look at their certificate. Certificate. Ooh, that's embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> now they're still promoting the video. So did you, I, I think it just sort of says something about how sophisticated they actually think people are that are buying EV certificates. There's um, another fun one. In fact, I shared that on Twitter a while ago. And then someone emailed me this one. And they said, oh, you'll like this. I just got an email to renew my EV certificate. And incidentally, you're paying at least hundreds of dollars every couple of years. Not much money for a big company, but it's hundreds of dollars that you don't need to pay as well. And uh, this guy forwarded me this email and said, uh, you know, there's this bit here in the bottom right, boost online sales with EV SSL. And there's a, there's a testimonial from this guy, Chris. And Chris is saying, this product really creates consumer confidence. My sales increased 20% at mostlydead.com. And about now, I think you can all see where this is going. Bam, bam, bam. <laughs> <laughs> and every single example I check, everyone's like ditching EV certificates and rolling over to DV, which makes me enormously happy. And it's, it's not. So, to be perfectly clear, it's not a hate thing about EV. I don't hate EV. I hate the misrepresentation of something doing something that it just fundamentally cannot do. And I, I think this sort of really sums it up. Security controls that rely on the absence of positive visual indicators don't work. People are terrible at looking at things like URLs or anything in the address bar and making decisions about the security posture of it. So what, what it's doing is it's creating a veneer of security which in actual fact doesn't work. And, and I wanted to sort of try and find a, a good illustration to, to wrap the talk up that, uh, that is, all, I guess, like an in real life analogy of that. And I, I found this, which is a biometric padlock. Now, it turns out the padlock does have a screw on it. <laughs> and the screw does what you would probably think it does. And that's not the fun bit, though. The fun bit is. <laughs> The guy I found is this bloke called the lock picking lawyer, and all he does is he goes around and pulls all apart physical padlocks. So he finds this problem and he reports it to the maker of the padlock, and they had the most epic response. They said, This lock is invincible to people who do not have a screwdriver. <laughs> <laughs> and this is basically what EV is. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hey, uh, I know we're going on boat cruises and stuff. We've got like two minutes. Does anyone have any questions? Everyone wants to go on the boat cruise and drink beer. All right, so hey, if you have any questions, ask me on the boat if you're coming along. Thanks, guys.